Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to um, be with you this morning. And I want to share a, a word with you. And this is from uh, Colossians. And I want to read Colossians chapter 1. Uh, reading from verses 24 to 29. Colossians chapter 1. Reading from verses 24 to 29. It says here, Now I rejoice. This is Paul writing to the Colossians or the church at Colossia. He says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me. That's a very interesting word and phrase. The commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28 and 29, these are my anchor verses for this morning's message. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. It's very interesting here, it says that admonishing everyone, teaching everyone and presenting everyone fully matured in Christ. The gospel is for everyone, regardless of our station in life. The gospel is for everyone. Discipleship is for everyone. And maturing in Christ is for everyone. I've entitled my message this morning, God's Commission. God's Commission to you and me. You know, I remember some 12 years ago, my family and I were, were in Barrio Highlands. That's where my wife comes from. We were having a holiday towards the end of the year. And one morning, I was up and was having my devotion. And as I was reading my Bible and as I was walking, uh, and then I, I felt the Lord draw near me. And I heard him say this. Now, this is very important for us, especially in a situation like now, the pandemic. He said, Dorai, what if you're no longer a pastor? What if you're no longer working in the church? What if you're no longer a full-time staff? What would you do? I heard that still small voice. <laughs> this morning, I pray that you will hear His voice. When everything has been removed from us in this pandemic, everything has been removed. Can't even gather. We can't do the normal things as we do in church. What will we do? I thought about it. I was not able to come up with an answer. So the day passed. Next morning, I was doing my devotion again. And the same question arose. I heard his still small voice and asked, what would you do? This time, not that I, I worked out something, but I saw. I saw. I think he must have showed it to me, but I saw. What is it that I saw? So I answered this way. I said, Lord, I would go and look for someone and share the gospel with them get them saved, and then I will disciple that person. And having discipled this person, I would then cause this person to go and multiply himself or herself, and then would create a movement. That's what I said. And I felt, and I felt I saw the Lord, the Lord smile at it. And you know, I came back, and I started on a discipleship process. Since 2008, I've been doing that on a one-to-one -one basis. So, 
basically what I do is to share the gospel, disciple people, multiply disciples, so that we can create a movement. And so, uh, that still small voice, what was it? The Lord gave me a commission. That is God's commission to me. Now, that is not the first time he spoke to me that way, actually. Uh, when I first became a Christian, something was lacking in my life. And I remembered while driving, I said, Lord, something is missing in my life. And he said, the Great Commission. That is, the very first year I got saved. And from then on, I started to preach the gospel. But, you know, uh, God seems to come back to that place of his commission, of his commission. This morning, we are seated here or hearing uh, this message. I would like you to consider this. God speaking to you, his heart is still on his commission for you and me. For every man, every man, three times he has mentioned, every man, every man, every man. It is not only for a select few, it's for every man. The verses I want to look at today are verses 28 and 29 in Colossians chapter 1. And I want to read from the uh, New Life version, and I, I've put it up here. It says here, we preach Christ. We tell every man how he must live. We use wisdom in teaching every man. We do this so every man will be complete in Christ. This is the reason I am working. God's great power is working in me. Then the next uh, version I want to read is J.B. Phillips' version. And, and this says, so naturally, we proclaim Christ. We warn everyone, we meet and we teach everyone we can, all that we know about him, so that if possible, we may bring every man up to his full maturity in Christ. This is what I'm working at all the time, with all the strength that God gives me. My friend, at this, during this time of pandemic, when everything has been removed from us, everything has been stripped from us, what will we do? The Lord says, I give you my commission. And what is the commission? Here in the NIV, it is very clear. Four fundamental things, four fundamental things that the Lord wants us to do. It doesn't matter whether you are in the church or outside the church, uh, whether you're an ordinary person or whether you're a pastor, whether you're serving or not serving. These four things, as you receive this Commission from God. This, this is it. Four things. Number one, preach the gospel. Preach Christ. Preach Christ. Number two, put on Christ. Number three, propagate Christ. And number four, produce in Christ. Now, I, I don't want this to be a, just a, a message at the end that you come and say, oh, it's a good one. I want it to be practical. So let's go back to the first one. Preach Christ. What am I saying? I want to say to you, my friends, go and look for someone. That's what I did. I went around preaching the gospels. One to one, one to one, one to one. I don't have to now depend on having a meeting and where people could come together. No, I don't have to depend. So I went to share the gospel. And when one person gets saved, then I begin to disciple that person. So the first one is that you learn to share the gospel on a one-to-one -one basis. Look around you. Go and look for someone and learn to, to proclaim the gospel. And once we have found and the person has received, next choose to disciple that person. And what is the whole discipleship is about? You teach that person to put on Christ. Now I want to tell you this. Unless you have put on Christ, you can't show that person how to put on Christ. You can't do that. So you yourself need to put on Christ. Then you show the other person how to do it. Now, once that person gets moving, then what we need to do is, then you have to get that person to mature in Christ. And the way to mature in Christ is to multiply yourself, making other disciples. And so, when you, so you encourage, you commission this person now and say, now you go and do the same. And then when the person begins to do it, then they are propagating Christ. But you know, all this involves work and it involves 
the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I said, this one can only happen in Christ, in Christ's power, which is the Holy Spirit. I want to look at the first one. Preach Christ. When we say preach Christ, what does that mean? In Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, it says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. And in Acts 13 verse, uh, verses 38 and 39, it says, Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin and made right with God. This is very interesting. Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And then he says, through him, we are made, he says, everyone who believes, everyone who believes is set free from every sin and they are made right with God. Now, let me get back here. What is the gospel? So we said, in order to proclaim Christ, in order to preach Christ, you need to keep the gospel of Christ central in your life, not in one corner, not only once in three months. No, it has to be central. Central means every opportunity you have on a daily basis, you need to share the gospel. Now, who is Jesus? Jesus is God. He says he's the image of the invisible God. And Jesus is God who became man. He died on the cross, rose from the dead on the third day, ascended to heaven, and offers us the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life to whoever believes. And we can receive this forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life through faith. Wow. Find someone and share the gospel. You know, uh, years ago, or two, three years ago, we have introduced what is called effective personal evangelism. And, and we have showed you how to do this. The two diagnostic questions and the five points of the gospel. We have, we have, we have done that. You know, I have uh, seen many people come through Christ, uh, to Christ through that means than any other means, at least in my in my uh, experience, you know, the first time when I went and shared with three people, two people got saved. Then uh, a month later, I shared with five people and all the five people got saved. My average is, if I share with ten people, seven people get saved. <laughs> and so, you need to go and find people. Start with your family, start with your friends and proclaim Christ. Now, you only proclaim Christ if you keep it central, the gospel is central in your life. Not once in a while. And waiting for the church to have evangelistic meeting or your CG is having some... Evangel no, no, no. If you need it is central, it is every day. We are waiting for opportunities. And so, proclaim Christ. Preach Christ. How? Keep the gospel central. You know, uh, you can do this during this time of the pandemic of the COVID-19. You don't have to wait for anything. And you have heard testimonies of how, even in your place in Sungai Long, how uh, more than 100, 122 people have come to faith during this time, during this MCO, because they have kept the gospel central and they have a means to share the gospel and they were able to proclaim Christ. So the first one is four fundamental things about this commission. When, you, when God gives you this commission, the first one is to preach Christ. Number two, it is to put on Christ. This is discipleship. It means to be set apart and devoted to Christ. Now, one of the things I found is why some people, even though they have come to faith, they don't move on with Christ is because they do not consecrate themselves, do not set themselves apart to the Lord and be, be devoted to Him. They, Jesus Christ is only about, He just occupies one position, one portion in their entire life. No. To be set apart to Christ means your whole life. Just now we sang, I give my heart to you. And that your heart will be my heart. That is being set apart. That is to be fully devoted to Him. But what does that mean? It means to put on Christ. You know the Bible says in um, 
in, in Galatians 3.27, that when we are baptized in Christ, you know, he's talking about water baptism, when we are baptized in Christ, we are clothed with Christ. Wow. <laughs> we are clothed with Christ. In, in Romans, in Romans uh, 13, verses 12 to 14, and especially verse 14, he says, be clothed with Christ. So not only we proclaim Christ, we put on Christ. We put on Christ. And I want to look at Colossians chapter 3 because in verse 10, it says here, uh, have put, put on, put on the new self, which is Christ. Put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of, of its creator. But you know, you got to read the whole of, of uh, chapter 3, as, especially verses 1 to 17, to understand what it means to put on Christ. Um, I'll just read here and there just to... to uh, bring some points in, in chapter 3 it, it goes on to say here since then you have been raised with Christ set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God set your minds on things above not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and then verse 4 when Christ who is your life in fact one translation says Christ is your life <laughs> Christ is your life and so here it says Christ is your life. And he says, when he appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Verse 5. No, this is very interesting. What it means to put, put on Christ. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That is why discipleship is very important. He says, uh, put to death. And what are these? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. You see, because of this, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid of yourselves of such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. That means put off your old self with all this and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And I want to read verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. So to clothe yourself with Christ means to clothe yourselves with compassion, to clothe yourselves with kindness, to clothe yourselves with humility, to clothe yourselves with gentleness, to clothe yourselves with patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Great, great chapter on putting on Christ. You need to go and study this. And as you study this, the Lord speak to you. And then in verse 15, and I like this, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. When you're clothed with Christ, then the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And then be thankful. One of the things about being clothed with Christ that is that you're always thankful, grateful. And verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell richly in your heart. <laughs> I like that. Oh, dwell richly, the word of Christ. So you have put on Christ, the peace of Christ, and then the word of Christ. And you can go and read this whole thing. So the first one is to proclaim Christ. So keep the gospel central. The second one is to put on Christ. This is discipleship because you've got to model it. You've got to model it for the disciple. You just can't have them to just go for class lessons and then they'll find it. No, they have to see it in you. And so you, you have to demonstrate to them what it means to be set apart, what it means to be uh, devoted to Christ. They'll see it in your life. They'll be able to share their struggles and how you could help them. Thirdly, we move on. Propagate Christ. It means to bring them to maturity. Grow to be mature in Christ. Grow to be mature in Christ. In, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you. And then in verse 2, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. One place in Ephesians 4.13, it says that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So there is such a thing as growing in Christ and growing to maturity. 
And then in 1 Thessalonians 6 verse 8, he says, Paul talks to the Christians at Thessalonica and he says, you have been imitators of us and the life of the Lord. You have been imitators. Number two, he said that you have been a model. And number three, he says that your message, this is the gospel, has gone out from you to a wide range of places. What does that mean? It means simply this. The secret of Christian maturity, I want you to listen to this very carefully. The secret of Christian maturity is that we learn and grow the most when we are involved in sharing our faith and discipling others. You cannot be just being alone and, and trying to be mature. You can't. It's only when you are discipling others, only when you are training others in sharing the gospel, meaning helping them to proclaim Christ and helping them to put on Christ. In others, when you help them, then you are you're propagating Christ and that's how you would help them to grow to maturity and you yourself growing to maturity. And I want to quote uh, Gunter Kralman and he said this, this is Jesus' idea was simply this, the paramount goal in bringing up everyone to maturity is to equip them so that they can spread the gospel message to multiply a Christ-like testimony. When Jesus said, follow me, and Jesus said, follow me. And many discipleship uh, classes or formats or processes will talk about having a character like Christ-like, which is true, very true, which we just looked at uh, in, in, in Colossians chapter 3. But part of being, and major part of being Christ-like is also to multiply ourselves, is also to share the gospel and to disciple others. And I think I've shared here before, you know, we have this great acronym which says, uh, do what Jesus did. Do what Jesus did. And we talk about preaching and we talk about teaching, we talk about healing. And, you know, but all this will only happen in the context of making disciples and multiplying disciples. You know, doing what Jesus did definitely includes disciple making and the multiplication of disciples. And so, the paramount goal in bringing up everyone to maturity is to equip them to spread the gospel message to multiply a Christ-like testimony. And I come to the last point. In verse 29, it says this, To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. In another translation says, To this end, I, st I struggle you know, I struggle with all the, the workings of Christ and the power that works in me. If you look at the word here in verse 29, he says, To this end, I strenuously contend, that is working, laboring, with all energy, again, working, so powerfully working. Three times is mentioned, three times is mentioned here. Now, what does that mean? It is hard work. <laughs> Don't you think that this commission that God gives you is a walk in the park, a walk in the garden, as some people call it? No, it is hard work. If you read the rest of the epistles of Paul, he said, I work hard. I work hard. It takes time. It takes time. You know, I, when I disciple people one hour a week, and my, actually my days are full, really. And uh, it'll go for six months, eight months. For some, it'll be longer. But it's hard work. But you spend that time. You spend that time with them. And as you do that, you know, what do you do? You use the Word of God, precept. And you use prayer. Now, I can tell you something. Without prayer, nothing really happens. Because how do you get the power of God? It is through prayer. <laughs> How do you get the power of the Holy Spirit? It is through prayer. Let me tell you. You know, way back in 1995, when the church launched into the Antioch Church Vision, and we were supposed to raise missionaries. And that year, 1995, I, we had four missionary candidates at the beginning of the year. But you know, by the time the year ended, when we were entering into 1996, I lost all the four candidates. I was very disappointed, I was very dejected. From four, it went to zero. And I knew what was lacking. I knew the strategy, how to do this, how to go and get people and put together. What was lacking 
was the power and there was no power because there is no prayer you got to pray for the disciples you got to pray for the disciples that's why paul in writing to the galatians he said i travel i travel i travel he said i travel again so that christ may be formed in you wow the people that we disciple we need to pray that christ may be formed in them because the enemy is also at work but we need to pray i don't know how i prayed for my children but whenever i prayed for my children i pray in the spirit of lord i pray in the spirit of lord <laughs> maybe that's the fruit today you see them because when we pray in the spirit god knows god knows travail and and in in colossians itself uh colossians 4 verse 12 you talk about epaphras epaphras is one of you a servant of christ jesus sends greetings he is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of god mature and fully assured while well, the mature person stands fully in all the will of god but he comes through prayer somebody praying for you somebody praying for you and only in the discipleship context this happens because they pray for you pray for you pray for you i before every discipleship uh session you know we'll pray for one another pray for one another wrestling in prayer in fact one one person had written colossians 4:12 in this manner very beautifully it was epaphras kneeling that made the colossian colossian church standing it's our kneeling that makes you standing wow prayer prayer is needed no wonder when paul opens up his epistles he starts with this long prayer i thank god at every remembrance of you and then he goes on praying for them you know we need to pray we need to work hard yes but we also need to pray with those whom we are discipling You know even in Colossians 4 verse 3 verse and uh, verses 3 and 4 this is about the gospel and and uh, Paul says pray for us that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains and verse 4 pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should I remember discipling one person in the beginning of the year and I was coming to an end and I said now I'm releasing you I want you to go and share the gospel and and she said Uh, I don't know who to share with so we listed out some names possible names that she had relatives some friends and we say let's pray pray over this list and I prayed this prayer I said lord that you'd open a door for her that she may proclaim the gospel you know what happened two weeks after two weeks she said I have shared the gospel with two persons <laughs> that is very powerful praise powerful praying in the power of holy spirit the secret produced in Christ now you know we have raised missionaries in the church and one of the things i learned was this is to depend on the holy spirit not so much yes i need to depend on the holy spirit but i also need to depend on the holy spirit in them so you need to depend upon the holy spirit in your disciples and therefore you need to open up avenues and opportunities for them that they would no and hear the still small voice i pray this morning that you would be hearing the still small voice of the holy spirit and he would guide and you read that in 2 thessalonians 3 verses 4 and 5 i'm not going to read that you can you can find that on your own and therefore let me summarize this that four fundamental things about the commission number 1 is to preach christ number 2 is to put on Christ not only you put on Christ upon yourself but also you teach your disciples number 3 is to propagate Christ multiplication and all this will only take place as we work hard as we pray pray in, and with the power of the holy spirit and and practice that means you have to do it it's not a theoretical thing but before i close i want to say this this commission that god gives us which we receive it has to be intentional it has to be intentional number 2 it has to be 
personal. It is just like in Barrio that God came and spoke to me. Dorai, what would you do when everything is taken off? What would you do? It's personal. And when I came back, I started doing it. It's very intentional. And then it is relational. The other thing about this whole area of discipleship is it is relational. That is why Paul was able to say, every man, admonishing every man, teaching every man, so that we can present every man. It is very personal, very relational. <laughs> discipleship is not just having some, some kind of just classes and just transmitting information, no. It is relational. Remember, there is also modeling. And number three, it has to be practical. It is not just head knowledge. It is something that they actually go and do it. And finally, it must be reproducible. Whatever that you are doing must be reproducible. Let me just say this as we bring this to a close. Find someone. Go and share the gospel and find someone when the person gets saved. You disciple that person. Don't go and take them and then say, church, now you disciple them. Go to New Believer Class. No, you, you do that. And we have resources for that and we can show you how you do that. Number three is to help them reproduce themselves. They can do it. They can do it. I've seen the people whom we have discipled. They have now gone and reproduced themselves. But the key thing is you have to send them, commission them. Commission says, yeah, you go down and, and then do that. But remember, it has to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. A lot of work, but as you pray in the Spirit for them, God will ensure that you will bear fruit. Let me close with this uh, quotation. And this is by Tom Nelson. If we succeed in every area but fail to make disciples who can spiritually multiply, then ultimately we have failed. Yet, if you fail in every other area, but succeed in spiritual multiplication, then ultimately, we have succeeded. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I want to, as I was preparing this message, the word that came to me is this. The word that came to me is this. This is what the Lord spoke to me. And He said, the Great Commission is for every believer. It's for every believer. Discipleship is for every believer. Maturing in Christ is for every believer. Now, some of you might say, you know, I have never done, I've never led someone to the Lord. I've been a Christian for so long. I want to say this. You can start today. Start today. Draw the list of all those persons whom you know, but who do not know the Lord. Pray over that list. Call them up. Make connections first before you share the gospel. Build that relationship or renew that relationship. Ask God to open that door for you to proclaim the gospel clearly. Talk to them one by one. And then, if one of them, or when one of them receives the Lord, disciple that person. We can help you with that. We'll show you. And then you can help them and, and teach them on how to share the gospel and how to disciple. And they can themselves can go and do it. And pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. You can start. This is the word that I want to bring. That commission is actually our stewardship of the gospel. That's what the meaning word is, original meaning. We are stewards of that gospel. How is it possible that we are clothed, on, clothed with Christ? Meaning we are put on Christ and that we propagate Christ, but yet we are not proclaiming Christ. How is it possible? It's not possible at all. If we are clothed with Christ, we have to be clothed with the proclamation of the gospel. We have to be clothed with the commission. Today, as I was preparing this, I saw a picture. The picture is this. We have been clothed with Christ. We have been clothed with the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. But we are not clothed with His commission. We are not clothed with His mission. We are not clothed with His message. 
I saw a picture where, you know, if I were to take this one and, and then just drop it here, this is, this, this is, this is that, that cloak as it were, the cloak of commission. This is a picture I saw this morning, my friends. Will you pick this one up and say, I want to put on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to put on the Great Commission. I want to put on the commission that God has given all of us, which I've neglected so long, but today I want to put on. And I want to begin to share Christ. And that's the beginning. Once you start that, the rest follows. Shall we sing this song once again? <laughs>